Christoph. Okay, thank you very much for inviting me to this. Uh, I wasn't exactly sure what to expect, but I think now uh, Luke's given me enough prompts that I have a sense of what I should be saying. Uh, the first thing is, uh, I think my general relevance to this topic is because of the Humanity 2.0 thing, and this has to do with the kind of uh, fork on the road that we seem to be in with regard to where humanity is going. Um, and uh, in a way, Rachel alluded to uh, sort of the options on the table, and of course one of the options is this more technically enhanced, technologically enhanced version of humanity that we've been hearing so much about, and uh, on the side of which I primarily would stand. But then there's this other side, uh, which also should not be underestimated, uh, and that is the idea that uh, human beings should re-embed with animal nature. Um, and from that standpoint, uh, people who hold this kind of view, and I'm thinking, you know, in the first instance of animal rights people, there are some very strong distinctions to be maintained between being a human being, being an animal, and being a machine. Uh, and that the sort of, you know, uh, blending and merging that is so much celebrated in this context is actually one of the things they very much call into question. Um, I uh, was at a conference, I spoke at a conference uh, that took place at Yale in December uh, on non-human non personhood. Uh, and this was, one, and, and this was uh, on the back of a case that was being heard in the New York State Courts uh, about liberating some chimpanzees uh, and claiming they had rights. And they had rights as understood under law as it already exists. Um, and uh, this was a very kind of milestone uh, moment, but what this conference was doing on the back of this was bringing together the people who were claiming um, machine rights uh, and cyborg rights on the one hand with the animal rights people. And they are chalk and cheese, completely different in orientation. For one thing, uh, the animal rights people wanted to maintain these very clear distinctions. And so there was a sense in which giving rights to the various beings was kind of segregationism. Okay, uh, and so you know, Rachel said at the end of her talk, right, that we might be moving in many different futures and diverging, you know, subspeciation of humanity and stuff like that. And Rachel very optimistically says, ah, but we'll all recognize each other as human, you know, regardless of where we take this humanity stuff in the future. I'm not so sure, okay, uh, because there is going to be a fundamental question about the extent to which the blending and the merging and the kinds of things that we're talking about here is accepted. Right, uh, and 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 there is an issue here, you know, in, because when we talk about things like personhood and rights and also responsibilities that particular entities have for particular things, it becomes very important to know kind of what the boundary is around which we are actually ascribing these properties. And I do think that one of the you know one of the potential problems that we get into uh, when we sort you know is is we're not sure if we if we have someone who was born a human being and then gets enhanced in various ways technologically, so in fact has lots of powers that human beings are very unlikely to get unless they're like that, right? Do they then fall under the rubric of, let's say, human rights? Or is there some other category of legal recognition that's necessary? And I think it's not too early to, to, to start thinking about this, and it, and it follows up on some of the points you were raising about, you know, what kind of a moral world we want to live in. And I do think that the issue of rights is a very useful way to think about this matter, in terms of what kinds of entities have what kinds of rights. Um, so that's a very important, I think, kind of uh, hook into this, and it kind of, in a way, expands the discussion a little bit. But I also want to pick up on the point that Luke raised um, at the start about ableism, uh, because I do think that's, um, that's one, this ableism which is a term that gets used very much in the, uh, in the transhumanist literature, and I talk about this in Humanity 2.0, and in this, this new book that I see there are flyers for here, The Proactionary Imperative. Um, and um, and the, the point here is that there, there are two points to be made about ableism. First of all, there's the point that if, if it is available to us, and, and again, your talk, Nigel's talk at the end kind of, gave us the, the positive rhetoric of this, right? Namely, if it is possible to be enhanced in a certain kind of way, why not do it? Right? Uh, and, that, and that if these capacities that, you're gain, that you, you would be getting would in, fa in fact improve your life, improve your existence, why not have it? Right? So that's part of it. There's, a, there's that kind of move. But then, as it were, there's this kind of larger social collective consequence of everybody thinking this way. Okay? Um, and here we get into a problem that uh, economists call problem of positional goods. And that is to say where the value of certain kinds of uh, goods are actually tied to their relative scarcity. Okay? 
Uh, and, and so, you know, in a sense, it, you know, if, if enough people get certain kinds of prosthetics, right, then those who don't have it feel they're left behind. And so even though they might not have had an intrinsic interest in getting them, they feel that they do need to have them now. And not only do they need to feel they need to have it, but also the society is beginning to get organized around this. Right? So in terms of job possibilities and all kinds of stuff, right, as it were, the bar gets shifted. And you have to be catching up in various ways. And so all the pharmaceutical enhancements, which we really aren't talking about here, but, you know, that's kind of where the action is on that front. Right? This is, a, you know, in a sense, ableism encourages a kind of, you know, economy of positional goods with regard to human enhancement. Uh, and, you see, this, is, this can potentially be a real nightmare, but one of the things that it points to, I think, um, is that we still don't have any very good uh, conception of what, a, what, let's, for the sake of argument, call a transhuman person looks like. Right, because when we talk about able, you know, trying to enhance various abilities, we're sort of abstracting certain kinds of capacities that normally the value of which we can determine because it's part of a package deal called a person. Right, so you don't need to run infinitely fast. You just need to run as fast as someone who has all these other properties, you know, that that are together in this being called a human being. And so then you can, you know, figure out what is normal, acceptable. Beyond what point does it become just extreme and grotesque? And that's because you have a kind of clear conception of what a person is. But what ableism does, and I think this is very much what often happens in the human enhancement discussions, is you, you kind of erase the person, and what you instead have are these abstract capacities, abstract abilities, which are then being promoted indefinitely by whatever means possible, and then people claiming on sort of libertarian grounds they're entitled to it. And what sort of a person you end up with, on the other end of that, if enough people do that, right, is, is never really being very much discussed. So one of the things that I would put on the table, and I'm someone who actually supports human enhancement, is that we need to have a clear discussion of what does the whole package look like of these, you know, what does an enhanced person look like? Because otherwise we're going to get this kind of runaway problem of positional goods where people will just be measuring their worth in terms of whether they have the latest device on them. Okay, and I think I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. I think that's enough provocation. <laughs>